Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, the place for knife lovers and knife collectors to come and hear from the people who make this whole knife world go round. Plus, on Wednesdays, we dig into my collection and what's coming out there in the knife world. So coming up, we're going to take a look at the CRKT Razzle Cliff in D2, uh, courtesy of Knife News. Thank you very much. Uh, in the state of the collection, we're going to look at some oldies but goodies from Cold Steel. And then the main topic, these knives on the back wall, all the blades behind me. Uh, we're going to take them down, take a look, and I'm going to tell you what they are and where they came from and uh, their provenance as much as I know them. Uh, they've been around uh, a long time as my background, but also they've traveled with me from uh, living place to living place, and I've been accumulating them for years. So uh, they deserve a little bit of a spotlight. But before we get to any of that, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and the like. And uh, remember just to check in with us, uh, not only here on YouTube, but also on all your favorite uh, podcast apps. Okay, so first up, pocket check. So today I'm carrying, um, it was my, f my second custom folder, uh, second of two. I don't, I don't have many of the custom folders, uh, but this one is special to me. It was one of the first folders by this maker. This is the attention to detail mercantile, uh, Mark one. This is the large model. Now, um, he, uh, Douglas Esposito out of uh, Manassas, Virginia started making these, uh, after after a few years of making fixed blades, I actually have a custom fighter from him, which is a beautiful knife. He started making folders. This was one of his first, and it's got you know I, at Blade Show I, I checked out all of his recent work, and it's super smooth. This this has a little bit of beginner issues to it, uh, mostly in the uh, smoothness of it. I mean, it's very smooth, but it's the detent needs to be dialed in, stuff like that. All that stuff he he worked out. In the meantime, but the thing that really got me about this is this exquisite contoured micarta inlay, absolutely seamless. Uh, he did that with a panograph, which is a very interesting machine. If you don't know what it is, it it has uh, two two portions to it. One uh, sc uh, scribes or cuts into metal, and the other side you're using a pencil like device to draw things out. So as you and it can scale things up, scale things down, or keep them the same. So as you draw out the pattern that you want to cut out of the titanium over here, it's doing so over on the other side. Okay, that's a that's a, a really uh, blunt explanation of what a panograph is. It is a fascinating machine. It's old school and it still works. And this was before uh, Douglas got CNC machining and stuff like that in his shop. So definitely a prize knife. Um, like I said, maybe for the seasoned collector, this old one might have a few things that uh, you could see needing improvement. But he's got all of the requisite ingredients built into this. He's an excellent grinder, and this is an early folder of his, and it's super thinly hollow ground. Great cutting blade. Great ergonomics. Um, evocative of the Strider. Uh, knives and other knives in that uh, sort of triumvirate of greatness. Uh, so I really dig this knife. I feel like I got in on the ground floor of Douglas Esposito and his uh, and his cool stuff. So happy to be carrying this today. This is one that I've uh, resolved recently to carry more often. I babied it. I have babied it for the time I've gotten it. It was not inexpensive, and uh, but now I'm I'm figuring this should be carried. All everything I have should be carried if I can. I shouldn't be too precious about anything. And this was meant to be used. So I'm going to start doing that more. And then maybe the more I carry it and the more I fiddle with it, the less those little nerdy issues will bother me or the, the more they might get broken in. Okay, next uh, in my front right pocket, just kind of hanging out is my quill. This is the uh, Wingard Wearables quill. Uh, an interesting little forged piece of steel, uh, square in cross section diamond tipped and then on this backside sort of flat spade like uh area this thing is a multi-tool believe it or not yes it has a lot of weapony as um sort of uses you could you could use this as a um sort of a punch pick 
uh, in a bunch of different grips. I like the hammer fist the best. Um, but also, this little thing is great for a couple of other things. It's a great worry stone if you're the sort of person, and I assume you are because you're watching this show, who fidgets with things or, or has a material connection to things. Um, this is great for, uh, I, I use it as a worry stone at work, you know, like I do with my knives too. Um, so, uh, but it's also great for carving a coffee cup. You go to Starbucks and that little tiny hole that's supposed to carburate the, the, the flow of the coffee into your mouth isn't big enough. Boom. Uh, you need a staple removed. Boom. This has a lot of just ordinary, um, mundane uses. Also, it was designed by Zach Wingard's wife to fit behind the ear. Uh, there are several different sizes of this. This one just, you know, looks crazy goofy on me if it's behind my ear. But it's an interesting sort of uh, um, aspect to it. If you're a jewelry person and you think you can get away with wearing, oh, yeah, there's Bob with his crazy jewelry. Is that a bass clef? Oh, yeah, it's a bass clef. And then you pull it off and you have a, an instrument of mayhem in your hand. So anyway, I, I like this thing for its... For its uniqueness, each one is hand forged in, uh, I think, either Pennsylvania or Mississippi or both. All right. Next up, uh, thirdly and lastly in, in my daily carry today on my hip at the three o'clock position is the um, Hogtooth Knives Tanto EDC Fixed Blade. And before I remove it from this excellent sheath, I want to show you how it shipped. It shipped with that uh, incredible. I love these discrete carry concept clips really excellent sheath with great retention not too strong not too light uh just perfect just like the rest of this knife this thing is an ideal edc fixed blade it is extremely capable at three and a half inches hollow ground 154 cm tanto uh very very capable with that smallish rounded off handle very good for in the waistband carry and I suspect any other style of daily carry for a fixed blade knife. And if you get, you could, I've dropped this in the pocket before. Now I'm not a fixed blade in the pocket kind of guy uh, because I wear skinny jeans. No, I'm just kidding. I don't. But uh, I could imagine um, if you have very capacious like cargo pants or whatever, this would be no problem. But when I sit down, I don't like a big fixed blade in my or a fixed blade in my pocket. Uh, but uh, everything about this knife is really really excellent and then i got a chance to use it and was blown away by it now uh what i'm talking about is um i talked about this before i was doing a um uh we were doing a, a family fire pit and i was i had a bunch of knives out there that i expected were going to be excellent for feather sticking um of course i like my feather stick with a bick but I, I just wanted the experience to to see how these things cut and uh, none of the knives i brought out were doing what I thought they should be doing or as well. And so I pulled this out and this was my feather sticker for the night. This thing did a fantastic job. Of course, I got it thinking of it as a little tactical knife, but <clears throat> it's outstanding for utility. Uh, you should check out Hogtooth Knives. Uh, go to go to Instagram, check him out. Um, Matt Chase, he made that exquisite uh, sub hilt folder that I got for my 50th birthday. So uh, definitely check him out. These little fixed blades are awesome. And I'm going to commission him to do one of these in Warncliffe and one of these in a Bowie as well. One of these days I'm going to, I'm going to commission that. Uh, so uh, check out, he's been on the show a couple of times um, talking about, talking about his forging process and, and other things. So check that out. Uh, also, you can check out uh, the upcoming Knife Junkie podcast number 297 by going to thenifejunkie.com slash 297. It'll take you right to the site. It'll take you right to that episode, and you can see all the show notes. Also, you can go over to Patreon and support the show if you think it's interesting uh, what we do here. Um, help help support the uh, infrastructure of the show, and also sometimes it helps get knives in. Uh, so you can scan right over here with this uh, QR code scanner here and go check out the, the different tiers of support the highest tier of support so far i think we're going to go for a ludicrous level at some point but the highest support right now uh gets you enrolled in a monthly knife drawing that's a that's a big thing plus uh, it doesn't matter what tier of support you get extra uh interview so every week i interview someone and you get extras uh from their exclusive content which is always fun uh, so check us out on Patreon. As you can see from that address, the quickest way to get there is to go to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. I will repeat that very long address. It's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon.
You're listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast, and now here's the Knife Junkie with the Knife Life News. One of the most unique uh, blade designs in the EDC world over the past 15 years has been the John Graham Razzle, or Razzle. I've heard it pronounced both ways, actually, but I, I'm going with Razzle. Uh, the Razzle is a, well, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's a razor-like chisel knife so it's got a square blade that has an edge along the bottom a flat edge along the bottom and then it has a flat edge like a chisel right up the front and uh, very I would imagine a very very useful blade shape I've never owned one myself good buddy of mine owned uh, the knife we're about to talk about in its uh, previous life this is the CRKT Razzle Cliff it's the Razzle Cliff because it's a bit of a worn cliff with that uh, dropping uh, point and chisel. I mean, uh, dropping point and swedge. You'll see that chisel front edge here is canted backward, more like a Warncliffe. On the original Razzles, uh, it was straight up at a 90 degree angle from the straight cutting edge. Uh, the big news here, this is a knife that sells like mad. I mean, they've been making this. This is the inexpensive version of this knife. Uh, if you want to get the John Graham version, you're going to be spending in the thousands at least or, or 8,000 at least. So if you want to get this um, in a production model, you're going to CRKT. They have a couple of models. This one has been very popular at about a 2.6 inch blade, but now they're making it in D2. They have finally, after all of these years, gotten through their gigantic cache of eight CR13 MOV. It's as if the CRKT steel buyer 20 years ago was like this Steel is going to be all the rage, and we have a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to get a gigantic cache of HCR 13 MOV. We better do this now so that we're not uh, uh, regretting it in the future. So they finally made their way through all that HCR 13 MOV, and they're making the Razzle Cliff out of D2. I love D2. I, you know, I remember when D2 came out, and it was a big deal. Uh, it's it's still 100% awesome and acceptable. It's not as uh, refined as some of the more modern uh, powder metallurgy steels, but it's a pretty pretty damn good steel. So it's a huge upgrade from HCR 13 MOV to go to, uh, into this Razzle Cliff. They're also uh, replacing the steel show side, which made this little knife kind of heavy, uh, with a, a new polymer. What's this thing called? It's a new sort of G10 micarta e polymer that they're calling uh resin infused fiber so you know it's G gfn i guess grn uh, but it looks nice it's going to be uh, uh much lighter and the steel is a way up is a is a quite an upgrade so check out the new crkt razzle cliff compact now in d2 all right next up is the um uh real steel luna uh the uh Poltergeist Bladeworks, Jacob from Poltergeist uh, Bladeworks has designed a whole bunch of stuff for real steel. This is the Luna, uh, a slip joint. And now they've come out with it in titanium, but now they're coming out with it in three special uh, colorations. And it really adds a, a, a bit of, um, what do you want to call it? Class to this already classy and simple design. Now you look at the design, the profile of the knife is, is all uh, Jacob. Now, I can never remember exactly how to pronounce his uh, complex Polish last name, but it begins with a W, uh, like Korskowitz or something something similar. Sorry for the butcher job there. But uh, you can really see his design style in this. If you know Poltergeist Blade Works, you, you can see it here. But they have taken the handles and colored them in three different uh, sort of very graphic um, patterns. Unlike a sort of anodized job where you're uh, covering and making the whole uh, handle a certain, you know, color or whatever. This has three different flavors, a gray crackle, which looks sort of like a parched earth to me, a blue camo, which is really nice. It's a mottled sort of urban camo with gray, black and blue. And then they have blue geometry, which is a, a geometric pattern. This um, sort of inscribed, not inscribed, I'm sorry, uh, sort of. Uh, colored onto the blade they're using a uh a, a process that is simpler uh, uh it's similar to anodizing or uh, not similar to an it's unsimilar to anodizing more similar to painting uh onto the uh 
titanium. I don't know what the process is, obviously, uh, as you can tell from my talking about it, but that's how they stipulated the difference. It's not just your run of the mill anodization job. It is more of a uh, applique onto the handle. So uh, it'll be cool to see how that wears. I love how uh, different, um, different treatments to titanium and aluminum wear on the, on the corners and the edges. So I suspect these will, these will look very, very nice as they wear in as well. Uh, but very interesting in that it is a slip joint and that it's titanium. You're getting a lot of different, um, different, <clears throat> you're crossing a lot of streams with this design. And I think it's interesting. I also really like uh, Jason's work and <laughs> Jason W of Polster of uh, Poltergeist Works designs. I think they're stunning. All right, coming up next on the Knife Junkie podcast, we're going to take a look at two oldies book goodies and then I'm going to turn around. We're going to take a look at uh, these swords and blades on the wall and talk about what they are and where they came from. All right here on the Knife Junkie podcast. And now that we're caught up with Knife Life news, let's hear more of the Knife Junkie podcast. We all know Cold Steel, and we all know I love Cold Steel. One thing that I don't have enough of, I have decided, of Cold Steel are their machetes. Now, they have an entire constellation of machetes, uh, some made in, I think the, the one I'm about to show was made in South Africa. They have others made elsewhere. And they are great, thin, 1075 or sometimes 1055 uh, spring steel blades. And they are they come usually needing a little bit of sharpening. This one did. Uh, I think they've gotten better about sharpening their machetes, but it's something that they farm out to another company. And and uh, I don't think that they receive them, sharpen them and send them out. I think they just drop ship them, if you will. Uh, so the one I'm going to show you here is based on. Oh, what I was going to say is that this whole constellation of cold steel machetes are based on ethnographic designs from around the world. So you don't have the money to buy a or, or or the desire to buy either an antique barong or or a fancy modern uh, barong with all the all the wood and steel fixtures and such you can get one of their machetes and that will scratch your itch and it's a great working tool too so as you may have guessed this one is the barong machete i've had it a long time it's been hanging in my closet ever since i sharpened it and i i've used it like maybe once so this past weekend uh, i mentioned uh, last week or two weeks ago, I brought this thing out and cleared up the lawn with it. I had a lot of uh, deadfall from, from the winter. We have a gigantic tree in our backyard that, that uh, occasionally drops huge limbs that I'm just glad I'm not under when they fall. So I took care of that with this. Now, listen, part of, part of the experience of this is listening. Oh, all right. It's not, it's not doing it for you. I'm going to try it one more time. Listen. Okay. Usually when you draw this, this barong machete, it goes Hing! just like, like a movie sword. And, uh, you know, we all know that that's an unrealistic sound in the movies, unless it's, unless they have like a metal ferrule that the, the blade is scratching against, which is, wouldn't make sense. Anyway, so here it is. This is the barong machete. Now a barong is, is a Filipino, a Southern Filipino blade, and it is a leaf shaped blade. Sometimes they are longer and thinner, but mostly they are in this uh, sort of 24 inch to 27 inch uh, range with a deep belly and a leaf shaped blade. And that belly, that continuous belly, subtle as it is, man, does it work like a charm. So this machete um, did amazing, uh, amazing work. I cleared, let's see, I had two giant... Uh, white pine i gotta hate white pines and our neighbors have one that's constantly shedding on our lawn and then we have a large huge gigantic tulip poplar and they're soft wood trees uh and that has been dropping limbs so that that's what i took care of this is what i took care of all of those with not for nothing i gotta say this coating uh was really nice too it i feel like it's it went through the um sticky sappy white pine limbs with with some ease i thought you know uh, nothing fancy taught me years ago that it's good to use wd-40 if you're doing a lot of wood processing and i forgot to bring it out and this really worked well and i gotta say all it took was some isopropyl rubbing alcohol to uh to get it to get the sap off of that blade so a really really nice nice blade uh, i do recommend you check out cold steel for their various uh machetes 
Um, they have, like I said, you want a Chinese war sword and you don't feel like forking out Chinese war sword money, get a Chinese war sword machete. And for 30, 40 bucks, uh, you know, you could be king of the battlefield. Uh, so this ships like all cold steels um, with, uh, you know, a, a, a usable sheath. I, I have no reason to get another sheath for this thing. Uh, one thing about this Barong machete that's different from the one they sell now is this has the uh, traditional sort of El Salvadorian machete handle style uh, with this sort of neutral handle with a palm swell and then that uh, bird's beak tab that comes off the back. It looks more like a duck bill. And this, you know, aids and allows allows you to chop for a long period of time and and not have to have your grip so tight. And uh, so it's a it's a great way of keeping the blade in hand. Now with the Barong machete uh, from Cold Steel, they make it with a more traditionally shaped handle, which also aids in keeping the hand, uh, keeping the knife in your hand. So Oldie but goodie, the cold steel barong machete. Just pulled it out of storage, and man alive, does it work well. And not for nothing, but it reminded me, you know, if you're going to keep a machete in your closet for safety, it's probably good to pull it out every once in a while just to remember that it's there. Okay, next up. Oldie but goodie that I walk by daily many, many times, and I forget that it's there. Uh, I mean, I know it's there, but I walk right by it all the time. And it's this cool thing. It is the sword cane, one of the sword canes from Cold Steel. This is the heavy duty sword cane. And um, this one I discovered along with Crocs at the same time. Yes, you know what I'm talking about. Crocs, the ugly shoes I happen to be wearing right now. Ugly, but comfortable. So the sword cane was uh, an acquisition. And when I lived in New York City, I lived a very peripotetic lifestyle. That is a $5 word. That means I walked everywhere. And, um, you know, that's that if you're not wearing the right shoes or what have you, you're carrying too much in your backpack or and you're walking on uh, concrete uh, all the time, there's repetitive stress that can come. And plus, I was doing a lot of martial arts. So I messed up my ankle a few times, messed up my foot and my toes a few times. And I discovered that Crocs are great when you have a messed up foot. They absorb a lot of shock. I also discovered that when you're hobbling around, it's great to have a cane, but not just any cane, especially if you're in a place like New York City. You want a cane that has a little extra to it. Now, this is not legal advice uh, if you're a New York City resident. You probably don't want to carry this. Uh, but I was stupid then. I am no longer stupid. Uh, this, is the, <laughs> this is the heavy duty sword cane from Cold Steel. Actually, it has some schmutz on it because a long time ago I did some cutting with it and. Uh, and never cleaned off the blade. But this thing is amazing. It, it is a very springy and stout steel. It's about a quarter inch thick, but I've gotten it. You, you can see it. You can see it flex uh, when you're banging into stuff with it. So it's not a brittle blade. It is comes to a zero edge on both uh, edges. It's quite sharp. And I say both edges because it has about an eight inch span of sharp edge on the top on the back too this is no joke uh, this i mean all of their stuff is pretty uh, serious uh, in terms of weaponry but if you were really to have to use this you would have a, an outstanding weapon in your hands i've used this a lot uh there was a period of time where i was taking my dog out at five in the morning and we were walking through the woods um you know as a morning ritual and i would take this like you know uh, in reality the like just this metal pipe that it goes into would be a weapon enough. Uh, but together, I mean, I'm sure I would go straight to jail. So this is not something you want to be too cavalier with, I would imagine. But uh, so it, it slides in. It's a hollow tube. As you can see here, it slides in. And then it's friction fit. There are two, um, two rubber gaskets here and here. And then it just fits in there. And you just kind of press it down and it's in there, but it draws uh, <laughs> relatively easily. All right. Well, this is an awkward position to be doing it, but if you needed this cane, you could use this cane. It's not, uh, it would not be something you would do uh, cane fighting techniques where you're, where you're hooking with that hook because it would draw the blade and suddenly uh, your adversary would be armed with a, with a very nice uh, sword. 
uh, very long. It's like a 36 inch blade. It's a nicely sized blade. I highly recommend it. Uh, if you are someone who needs assistance walking, who, what could be better than a sword cane? All right. Well, speaking of swords and big, big bladed items, let's take a look at these, uh, these things coming up behind us. Uh, I sit here all the time and these sit behind me and it's a cool background to me because I love walking in this room. This is my little man cave and it is little and I will uh, show it off sometime, but I love walking in this room and seeing those. And actually from across our basement, which is a place where we all hang out, it's a great basement. You can see this room if the door is open and it just looks like, oh, that's that stately room at the end of the end of the basement with all the swords. So uh, I take them for granted, but I'm happy they're there. And I figured I would show you guys uh, what these are because I've had a number of people ask um, about them. So why not just show them off? Um, I, I changed the cameras around a little bit to see if I can if I can better show off some of the length of these things uh, because they are big. They won't fit under the knife cam. So I figured I'd move the knife cam and this would be a different angle on the room. OK, so first up and I did uh, some research on these knives. Uh, just as much as I could. And I'll tell you where I got them and what they are. Okay, first up. This is a Chris. This is a Moro Chris. And the Moros and uh, the Moro region of the Philippines are the southern islands, and it's the, the Muslim part, and it's where the Moro tribe is from and they are a combative and uh they're a combative tribe or i should say they are where a lot of the kali that i've learned has has come from and um let me just show you this this thing they are known for using a number of different blades the the ganunting that's the sickle shaped blade the barong uh the chris and this is this is the chris wavy bladed straight bladed or half and half this knife, now in doing my research, I got this, this Chris sword from a um, Sixth Avenue flea market in New York back in the day. And it, I believe, was a, a bring back from an American GI from World War II. In doing the research of this, I, I can see, I can tell that that blade is old, but I don't think it's the original blade for this hilt. And I'll tell you why. I think that the hilt on this, on this, uh, Chris is of a much higher uh, quality than the blade itself. The blade is is pretty damn sturdy. You can tell it's been used and it is old and it's got chinks in it where it's collided with other sh things, perhaps swords. Um, but in what I've seen of this area of most of the Moro blades, there's a lot more uh, detail to it. And I can show you that on a Chris that's coming up. So I think that at some point this hilt was rebladed and it looks like maybe this was a, uh, a spring that was forged into shape, but it wasn't, but those curves I think were cut in. I don't think they're ground in. I don't think those curves were forged in. I could be wrong because the medial, uh, the medial spine curves ever so slightly, but another indication is sort of the very rough tooling in this area and in this area. These are significant, um, and they are also can be used for catching blades and also inflicting pain. But this looks slightly different from most of the Moro um, blades. So I'll get into that when I go downstream and get to the other Moro, Chris. But a really exquisite handle, um, and, and I love this thing right here. Like the Filipino blades all tend to have um, hilts or uh, pommels that are ornate and large and really meant to capture your hand. So you can be swinging all day on the battlefield without having to have a vice grip on that handle. You can, you can relieve some fatigue uh, in the swinging and the constant swinging by having that bird's beak. And in Filipino blade work, you're doing a lot of continuous motion. So to have that bird's beak there to hold your hand in so that you can relax your grip ever so slightly. I mean, you don't want to do it too much because you collide with another blade and, and that knife could come out of your hand. But um, so a very nice uh, example of what I'm not sure if anyone out there is a Chris expert. Let me know. Is this is this a, uh, you know, 
uh, a pre-World War II, uh, or is this is this a um, ceremonial piece or what? I something about it makes me think that it might be a rebladed hilt. All right. Next up is a World War II era Navy U.S. Navy cutlass. Uh, this is based on the 1917 model, and um, originally I thought it was a 1917 um, basket hilt uh, Navy cutlass slash Kluang. Kluang uh, is a Dutch word for saber because the the Dutch also used this and produced and manufactured these, but. In seeing these cutouts here on the on the basket hilt, these cutouts are consistent with the 1941 version of this knife. This was the last saber made for use in the U.S. Navy. Uh, how much use these got? I, I don't know. I mean, I, I can't imagine a cutlass working too effectively into a battleship and destroyer Navy, you know, modern Navy warfare because... Um, there's not too much shipboarding that happens, uh, but maybe like the swords in the other services, it's uh, not just ceremonial, but meant to be um, meant to be used in a pinch by uh, certain ranks. I don't know. I, I, I'm I'm unaware of why they would continue to make this uh, into the into the 40s, but maybe they decided. Maybe they discovered. Uh, that they were not necessary at a certain point, and they didn't make them afterward. But this is a 1941. It's made by um, Milsko, which is a company out of Wisconsin, Milsko Manufacturing. And uh, this, also a New York City flea market purchase. You're going to hear that a lot. I love this uh, little clip point on the end. Uh, you could sharpen that. It's not sharp, but if you sharpen that, it would be a fearsome addition uh, to to the effectiveness of this knife because of this blade because you can do a lot of uh, with a saber you can do a lot of that sort of backswing cutting that you see in Sikh swordsmanship. <clears throat> okay. Next up, this one is one of those knives that sometimes if you're scrolling through cable and you come across a a haunting show they'll talk about how things themselves can carry spirits or or can carry a vibe now i've never felt this myself but uh, uh i remember showing this to a friend uh years ago and she was like out of all of the knives she was looking at at the time that i was showing her she thought this one had a vibe to it she was like oh this has done bad things i can't remember exactly what she said and i was like well it, it's a filipino blade and a fighting blade from a certain time probably did you know um but it's called the garab and it's got a nice wooden sheet it's, it's a falling apart wooden sheath but it's 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 uh you know a nice one <laughs> but here's the blade look at this blade now this really shows off something i talk about a lot on the show it is uh the angle of the blade to the handle the angle of that blade to the handle acts almost like a kukri you've got that downward sweeping blade it's contacting the material that you're cutting long before your hand is on the same axis so you can power through things um incredibly with that sort of downward downward uh, angle to the of blade to handle makes it a wicked fighting blade or a an outstanding um you know machete or work blade this is saber ground, so it's flat on this side, and you have your edge on the out on the. If it's in your right hand, you have the uh, the bevel on the outside. It's really sharp. It is very sharp. And now I did touch this up years ago, but it's sharp from about halfway down the blade to the tip. Here, you could hold it like this and and do that kind of thing if you had to. You could choke up all the way a full hand up onto the blade and use it for close in work whatever that is and uh, or detailed work and uh, you're good to go i think uh, for me this was made for a right-handed person because of how the chisel was put on and i think this is a rehandle the other one was a reblade i think this is a rehandle cuz ordinarily like i said you don't see this kind of perfectly round handle 
on Filipino knives, and you usually see some sort of a elaborate or at least a complete hooking bird's beak thing on the back. Oh, this fer feral is just sliding off. Um, so I think the blade must, or the handle must have, or the blade must have outlived the original handle, and the person took a piece of furniture or something, or just lathed out a piece of wood and put it on there. But something you almost never see in an actual fighting blade is a, or, or work blade for that matter, is a perfectly circular handle because there's no way to index that edge unless you're using your thumb. And um, but even in that case, you, you're not exactly sure where that edge is. So um, I think this was a homemade knife, and then I think it was a homemade uh, re rehandling. Uh, the Garab or Garab knife also bought at a at a flea market in New York City. Now, this one, I think, just in uh, in pulling it off the wall, uh, this one is going to take a little bit of work because all of these have required a little bit of uh, restoration. This one, I hadn't realized how uh, sort of depleted the sheath had become. <clears throat> so I'll have to take care of that. Next up is a Bowie given to me by my brother the uh origin of which is sort of unknown um all right let me let me show this to you close up this has stamped into the tang or not the tang i'm sorry into the ricasso that says wj McElroy, and over here it says macon georgia 1863 and uh I have seen uh, a number of these online, just a couple of them, and they've had differing levels of similar similarity to this. So they've all said Macon, Georgia. They've all said the uh, W.J. McElroy, which was an actual Confederate weapon maker. Um, but I have never seen online, just in the little bit of research I've done, any examples of this knife that were genuine that were in this great shape you know if this were actually made in 1863 and it's in this shape I, I, i'd be shocked um so i'm i'm i think somewhere along the line this this is a fake now it's a very it could be a very very high quality and old fake to the point where it's a collectible fake like you can see jimping on the back side of these quillions you don't you don't see that on all of them so this 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 does have some hallmarks of a real like old and very nicely made knife. I just don't think it is what it says it is. Uh, anyone have any ideas? Now, I reached out to um, uh, je the gentleman, uh, Mr. Zelinsky. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm spacing on his Richard Zelinsky uh, from Knife Magazine. He is an expert on Bowie knives. He said that this was probably a replica, but he couldn't tell without actually having it in hand. And uh, I tend to agree with it, <clears throat> but you can tell it's very old. So it's an old replica. And in a sense, that's kind of cool, too. <laughs> uh, it is quite sharp. It is very, very serviceable. It's got a bone handle with a, a million pins, well, 15 pins, uh, carved uh, sculpted brass, and those uh, S-guard quillions came in a, in, an, in a cheesy but old sheath. So I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm just not sure about this but i love it and it was a gift from my bro and uh it has a lifelong place on the wall of fame whoops well i'll just set this down and grab this this one also has a a lifelong spot in the on the wall of fame now this is a bolo from the philippines and it was made by a Filipino Marine. My dad went down to the Philippines. He's a World War II buff, and he, he's gone to a whole bunch of South Pacific uh, battlefields and, and naval battlefields as well, you know, places where the battles were fought. And in one of them, he was visiting some special Marines. He and the guys he was with went to a, uh, see a sort of demonstration uh, at a camp. And uh, there was one guy there who had made a number of bolos and he was selling them to guys like my dad. 
And my dad got this one for me. And I love this thing. It is rough and rugged. It is uh, made, no doubt, from a spring, from a, a car or a truck. But the piece of steel was just a little too short. And they put on some buffalo, uh, water buffalo horn and extended the handle. No, no matter that the tang doesn't come all the way to the back. This is not about that. This is not about fit and finish. This is about cutting power. And let me tell you, this thing is incredible. I, I did some videos um, cutting the cutting some pumpkins and I used this and it is amazingly sharp, amazingly sharp. It is a rough blade. It, it you know, it is comfortable in hand. They made it. They made sure that you could swing this thing and bang into stuff with it. And uh, it's not going to hurt your hand at all. Uh, but look at this thing. To me, it is the epitome of utilitarian savagery. I mean, like this thing uh, and then a very refined and beautifully made wooden sheath uh, with all of the sort of um, traditional flair to it. Um, so this is definitely a prized blade. All of these are prized blades for sure. But, um, you know, the fact that my dad was there, he hand selected this one. He looked at a number of them. He thought this one was the sharpest and the most um, felt the best in his hand. So, uh, yeah, very grateful for that. I, I owe my dad and my brother a lot for some of the very cool and unique knives they've given me. I'm going to skip over the uh, the tomahawk. Or I guess I'll show the tomahawk real quick. This is a modern interpretation of a eastern woodland spike tomahawk by Elmer Roosh. And he is a he is a legend who lives in. Uh, in Georgia, he's a legend in the forging world for making exquisite axes, tomahawks, and hammers. And I got this beautiful piece uh, at Blade Show 2021. Uh, but this kind of doesn't fit in the in the overall vibe of these historic blades, even though it's a historic representation. All right, next up is the Fairbairn Sykes model three so this is the third model that they made of the fairbairn sykes this was made towards the end of world war ii it's a machine ground blade uh, you can tell that because the uh, hand ground blades have a little v right here where where the two edges meet uh, the this pattern the number three so um obviously at the end of the war there are there are this started as a very specialized weapon. It remained pretty specialized, but they were making a lot more of them towards the end of the war. They had four companies that cast these handles. And I have a feeling I know which one cast this because you can see some of the markings in the hilt. You can see that, here, let me put it this way. In the pommel, you can see an arrow pointing up. And then you can also see a W and an E. And I think that that corresponds with a, a certain manufacturer that was one of the four making the handles for these. Uh, sort of sort of rough in that, you know, it's cast and you can see that seam and they file it down so it doesn't hurt or you can't feel it. But it's not, they're not making it look pretty. You know, they're not getting in there and really doing the work to make it pretty. They're making this knife to go to the front lines, wherever that was at, the, at this moment um, that this was made. Very sharp, remains very sharp. The blade is bent. Here, let's see. When you when you look at it, you can see a curve in it. Uh, I have heard that 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 happens sometimes with thin daggers. Uh, sometimes Fairbairn Sykes. I think I remember reading that uh, because they're kind of thin, kind of delicate, and you have it strapped to your body, and you're jumping out of planes or jumping out of t out of you know you're you're doing a living an active life as a commando, and uh, so they could tend to bend. I don't really think it does. Uh, much, I mean, I guess it, it does take the point off of where it's supposed to be. There's an interesting video. Just, uh, just look for this on YouTube. It's an old dude. It was like filmed in the early nineties and he's in a museum and he's an ex world war two British commando. Um, and he's got his beret on and he's an old dude, but he still looks like a 100% badass. And he's talking about the use of the Fairbairn Sykes. And he said, you would just, they, they were taught to just sort of pinch pinch it like this, like not, not a super tough grip. 
and you just sort of kept it close to you and you grabbed the guy and you pulled him into it. <laughs> That's how he described it. He's like, we didn't do that stuff that they do in the movies where you come up behind and you, and you know, we didn't do that. We, we grabbed the guy, you know, nape of the neck, and pull him on. And I was like, Ooh. just to hear this, this, this old chap say this it was, it's pretty intense. Check it out. I recommend it. This, so this knife has a, uh, a real serious pedigree and a beautiful, uh, uh, interesting history. I mentioned how no knives, no combat knives uh, have circular handles. This one has a 100% circular handle. Uh, but you do have these quillions here, and that's how you can index this blade. Uh, the, the, these ridges, the concentric ridges, or not concentric, but the, the ridges here in the handle really give you great grip. You're not going to slip off of it. So as long as you orient the, uh, the edge properly, and you can do that with, these, with this guard, you're good to go. Such an awesome knife. Another one that my brother gave me. Thank you, Victor. Uh, and here's another one. For my birthday this past year, my brother got me this very cool K-bar. Okay, uh, so this is a, a Mark II. This is a U.S. Navy Mark II knife. The Mark II is the Navy version of the K-bar. And this one is a World War II era. I thought originally it was um, Korea War era, but it is World War II era. And I, I have determined that from the sheath, from the uh, um, leather sheath. And you can see the owner uh, engraved a feather into it and did some little extra work, put another retra retaining strap in there. Um, uh, as they moved on, I think by the time they got to Korea, it was the metal sheath with the canvas fixtures. Uh, so I'm pretty sure this is a World War II era. Um, and it's made by Camillus in New York. It's got a little orange rust on there I got I to gotta take care of. And this stacked leather handle, oftentimes you'll see old stacked leather handles uh, start to get play in them because the leather shrinks and you have all that. This, not so. Not so. And it does not have the traditional K-bar um, pommel construction. Traditional K-bar, USMC K-bar pommel construction, how K-bar Knife Company did it, uh, is you have the tang coming all the way through here. You have the compressed stacked leather discs. You put the pommel on, and then a, a pin was driven through uh, this, the side of this, and through the tang, and that's what kept it on. This is screwed on. So I'm wondering if that's what is giving it the long-term stability. You can tell this was screwed on and cranked on tight, and it just hasn't budged. It's been kept in pretty good condition, but I love that rounded off tip. Uh, whoever owned this before me sharpened the swedge. Um, I love owning things like this and wondering what their history is. I'll never know what this knife saw. I'll never know what any of these knives saw, but owning them and thinking about that and knowing, well, they definitely predate me. All of these things predate me, except for the tomahawk and the bolo. And they experienced things much harsher than I ever have and hopefully ever will. And I wonder about the stories. Uh, with the exception of perhaps this Chris right here in the background, all of these other ones were made for and experienced some sort of combat. Um, so that just, I don't know, it captures my imagination. And and becomes another exciting uh, element to collecting these kind of things. Okay, so this is my other Moro, Chris. This is a more genuine one to me, at least through my research, more genuine in terms of a weapon. Uh, that would have been used. Part of that is the rattan. Now, that this other one may have had rattan that fell off, but usually you can see an area of of lighter wood where the rattan was if it fell off. So this is uh, this sheath here is two slabs of wood, camagong maybe, I don't know. Um, there are a couple of exotic hardwoods from the Philippines that they use. Uh, sandwiched together around the blade and then held together with two types of cord. I'm not sure what kind of cord this is. Maybe it's jute. And then you have the, the rattan strips there. Uh, obviously totally mangled here and held together with a, 
a modern piece of leather. But this is the real deal for sure. Look at this. Uh, so this is a uh, part of the, uh, this is that style that's half and half, half wavy and half straight. Um, the, the very straight blades, I know I wrote straight blade in my, in my lower third, but, but it is wavy. It just ends with a bit of straight. And uh, so they made them, they made Chris's in straight blade, wavy blade and half and half. Um, this one and the other one on the wall are kind of that half and half. It gives you, um, it, what gives you a, a, a more practical uh, front portion. Um, but the waves not only represent, have spiritual uh, significance, they also accelerate cutting. Look at this, recurve, 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 belly, 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 belly. I mean, a crisp blade is a nasty, nasty battle blade. So this one is pretty small. Uh, it's about a 20, uh, uh, what is this? About a 24 inch blade, about a five inch handle. Uh, all wood. It, you've got that same sort of jute wrapping, cord wrapping, and a sculpted handle. I love the sculpted handles of these damn knives from the Philippines. They're so cool. So this is this is a much more authentic um, hilt area, Ricasso area here. Uh, you can see it's made of two pieces. You can see this overlay piece, and then you have this piece that comes up here, and then this these little jagged portions of the of the hilt on the front and the back are significant they are uh good blade catches and good little sharpie sharp points to stick people with but they also have significance i'm not sure what the back is but the front that's an elephant and um that little hook is an ele elephant in some cases it's it's meant to be a blade catch if that's realistic i don't know maybe back in those days but the difference between this hilt and the other one is huge. The other one is, uh, you know, looks like it was just cut out of a piece of metal. This one was sculpted. Uh, this one I can tell was forged. And I've been curious about most, um, most Chris's, whether they're Filipino or Indonesian, are, are sort of San Mai uh, or, or in some cases Damascene. And uh, if, to discover that, I would have to dunk this in acid, I guess to sort of etch it. Um, I'd be curious to see if this has a different, a different core, like a harder in, internal core of steel. Uh, this was, uh, br my brother Vic gave this to me. Thanks again, Vic. What would I be without my family? I'd be nothing. Um, uh, so I was very happy that uh, this is one of those things I was in his den. He's got the ultimate man cave. And he's got a basket full of swords. <laughs> and I pulled out this one. I was like, Vic, when did you get this one? And after, after a while, he gifted it to me. I'm very subtle. You know, if you ever see a knife exactly like this again, buy it for me and I'll pay you anything. He's like, uh, okay, I'm picking up what you're putting down. All right, next up. The most significant knife on the wall to me is this one. This is a Filipino. Let me see. You can see this curve. I'll hold it up here. This is a Filipino Talibang. Uh, Talibang is a knife from the Visayas, the sort of middle portion, the middle islands. And it is, has been with me from birth. That's right. It's been with me from birth. So when my, uh, when I was one year old or just shy of one year old, my parents moved from Detroit, Michigan to Cleveland, Ohio. And uh, when they did, they went to a, um, a flea market, not a flea market, a, an antique store near Shaker Square, if anyone knows where that is. And uh, my dad bought this there. This is a G, definitely a World War II GI bring back uh, type knife. And in, in re uh, reaching out to my dad about this, um, he suspects it was brought back from someone. Uh, uh, he was like, oh, uh, the Visayans, that's where Leyte is. And there was, you know, all this action at Leyte Gulf. Maybe this was brought back by a GI there. Um, so this was the sword growing up. This this was up on a shelf way up high in my dad's den. And my brother and I would every once in a while be like, dad, dad, get down the sword, get down the sword. And he'd reach way up and you'd hear it move around on the wood shelf. And then he'd pull it down. I'd be like, oh my God, it's so cool. And uh, I, I can remember trying to hold it and it'd be like, you know, the blade would, 
It was heavy. It was so heavy. And uh, now I'm big and strong and I can wield it. Uh, I love this thing. I love that this is, again, epitomizes that downward angle of the blade with the with that wicked slashing belly and then a point right on the front just just in the ideal spot for some of these sneaky uh, around the corner kind of thrusts that they do in Filipino martial arts but this isn't just a weapon this was also great for hewing down uh foli foliage uh sugar cane and that kind of thing um i'm not sure about the handle i cannot tell if it if it's a rehandled blade and you can see here uh, I have this around just to hang it, but you can see where there are some notches carved into it where I believe there must have been a uh, uh, some wrap here and maybe a, a metal ferrule or something um, keeping this all together. So in a, I don't know if this is like a blade that was made by someone and then they just made a serviceable handle. The handle is very typical with this huge uh, part in the back to not only balance the weight, uh, but also give you really great purchase on it. Uh, but I have taken this handle off. This handle will slide off. Um, so ordinarily what they do in the Philippines is they fill the handle with a sort of sap. Well, I'm sure now they use modern epoxy, but they would use some sort of tree sap and tar and, and, and then the blade would be hot and then wrap it. And um, you see very few pins going through handles and Filipino uh, blades. So this one has been with me from birth. This is the Talibong from v Visayas. And it's my dad's sword. Love this thing. Uh, I'm very grateful that it ended up. I'm very grateful that it ended up with me and not my brother. <laughs> is what I'm trying to say. All right. Speaking of whom, this next one is from him. And that's the last gift from my brother on that wall. Uh, this is a, a Collins machete. And it is kind of a Spanish American war slap or um, wait, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, American, the Filipino war and um, World War One, like early 20th century. This thing is a fat slab of steel. Uh, this was made for the uh, American Army engineers in the uh, originally in the Philippines. I think they got this design from Philippines. It's a very Bolo-ish. I mean, it is their Type 3 Army Engineer Bolo machete. Litigimous, whatever that means. Uh, just a heavy beast. I mean, to call this a machete is almost seems like a misnomer because when I think of machetes, I think of light, fast, and thin. This is more like, I mean, I wouldn't use this to chop uh, light vegetation. I would use this to chop down trees, you know, and and just you're just going through bamboo and that kind of thing. Like this is a heavy duty blade. It's also still very, very sharp. You've got a walnut handle and you can see the, the, the grains in this. It's really cool how this wood has aged. It's like where the grains are. It's almost like material is missing. This is pinned in three different places on the tang, and it it's a it's a um, a tapered tang, which is interesting to me, uh, leading me to believe that this is forged. I mean, obviously, at, at the time, I think this would be forged anyway. But um, that taper tang is something you see more in like fancy knives these days. Uh, so it's kind of cool to see that. I don't know if it was a common uh, con construction. Um, in the past, but uh, there it is. Big old heavy Collins machete, big old heavy sh leather sheath with with a with metal shape and throat here. And the funny thing is, man, I just think of every like this is a heavy, heavy piece of kit. And you know, wasn't the primary whatever whatever. Sorry, whatever these guys were carrying, this was not the only thing. And they did not have light. Uh, wicking t uh, fabrics, you know, keeping them cool. They're wearing heavy canvas and wool and leather and big damn heavy belts full of heavy stuff. And this was one of them. To me, it's astounding. Uh, you know, we do we are not descended from weak men, as they say. All right, last one. Just got to take off the headphones for this. Okay. 
Here it is. Probably my favorite, uh, besides my dad's knife uh, sword, probably my favorite of the Filipino um, swords that I own and also just that are out there. And that's the barong. I showed you the barong machete before. This is an exquisite example of a Moro machete uh, made and built for speed, <laughs> made, made for combat, and uh, just a beautiful example. Look at that hilt. I'm not sure what this wood is, but it's exquisitely carved and detailed. And then there again, you have that signature bird's beak or hand hook that holds your hand in there without any without any doubt and allows you to swing in such a way that, that you don't have to have a death grip on the blade the whole time. Um, so here it is. I, I love this thing. Let's Let's look at this hilt again. Look at that. It looks like a burl wood. It's just a beautiful wood there. And then you have a sort of, I don't know, nickel silver, nickel. I'm not sure what this material is. And then it's uh, punctuated by this sort of braided jute cord. If the, the grip feels great, it is a 100% round grip. But as you come down, it widens out into a, um, in cross section, it widens out into an oval. And then you feel this on the, you feel the bird's beak on the top of your pinky. You know, the blade is oriented properly. The, the downward curving of this handle also adds, adds a, an additional angle of the blade here. Let me hold it over here. Additional angle of the blade to the um, cutting edge. So you've got a big, long, continuous belly on this leaf shaped blade here, big, long, continuous belly. And it's aided and accelerated by the fact that the handle is curved. And when you're all the way down on the handle, it's going to be like a pistol grip. And so that will present the cutting edge long before your hand gets there, kind of like a kukri, and will accelerate the cut. The other thing that this sort of curved pistol grip um, shaped handle or that angle of the handle to the blade does for you is that if you're going to use that point to thrust, you don't have to cant your hand, your hand to get the point where it needs to be. You're set up with a pistol grip. The point is already turned down, so you don't have to uh, change your wrist much. You just push forward, and the point will find where it needs to go. All right. Well, you know, I got to say, thank you for joining me on this truly a journey this time because, I mean, we went all over the world here. Uh, a lot, A lot to the Philippines admittedly, but we were also in Great Britain and the United States. So it has been quite, quite a long and strange trip. So I hope you enjoyed that. I'm going to leave it right there. Uh, I hope to get more of these great knives in the future. I do know that my brother has, has taken it upon himself. He's like, you get all the modern stuff for yourself. I'll find you all the cool old stuff. And I am so fine with that, uh, with that arrangement. So I'm a lucky man and I recognize it. I'm also a lucky man because I have Jim helping me make all this stuff look great. So thank you, Jim, as always. And um, be sure to check us out this coming week. Uh, I have Dave uh, Ridbaum from Kingdom Armory on, and he's the gentleman who designed the stovepipe, the new um, Spyderco uh, knife. That is so cool based after his Bill the Butcher model. All right, that's it for me this week. Be sure to check us out and download us on all the favorite podcast apps over there to the left. And uh, I will, uh, I'll will i be seeing you next week. All right, until then, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Mm -hmm.